the five white guys, I call them, you know. I said, are you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? It is Friday, January 12th. Deal or no deal? The White House rejecting a bipartisan DACA deal announced by a gang of six Senate members as immigration talks get overshadowed by President Trump's comments. We are live in Washington with the response from the White House. Putting more money back in your pocket. Most Americans getting bigger paychecks next month thanks to this new tax plan from the White House and Republicans. And it doesn't stop there. The brand new numbers just in. And do you remember this controversial cover showing President Trump having a meltdown? Well, wait until you see what Time Magazine has done now. Fox and Friends First continues right now. Good morning to you. It is uh, Friday. We made it to the end of the week, thankfully. It's been a long week. This is the best part of the song. Yeah. Oh, the song it? makes me happy. It's okay. That means that means <laughs> shut up, Rob. We gotta music. Okay. Just let's keep listening to this for a while. <laughs> Just kidding. A warm and rainy New York on this uh, Friday morning. It's uh, nice and mild outside. We love that. I'm Rob Schmidt. Yes, it is so nice to be warm. Yeah. And I'm Jillian Mealy. Thanks so much for starting your day with us. We do begin with this. Deal or no deal? A bipartisan group of senators coming to terms on a DACA deal, but the White House says, hold on, not too fast. And now those immigration talks are getting sidetracked after a very harsh comment from the president that has everyone talking today. Griff Jenkins live in Washington with the very latest on that. Hey, Griff. Good morning, Robin Jillian. The White House is not denying it. The president using an obscenity to blast immigrants coming from African countries in Haiti, saying, quote, why are we having all these people from blank hole countries come here? He stunned a small group of lawmakers in the Oval Office, questioning why the U.S. isn't focused on bringing more immigrants from countries like, say, Norway. Instead, the White House issuing a statement saying certain Washington politicians choose to fight for foreign countries, but President Trump will always fight for the American people, adding that the president is focused on a merit-based immigration system. But it seems the foot-in-mouth fever was bipartisan yesterday. Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi making her own controversial comments, talking about leaders working on an immigration deal. The five white guys, I call them, you know. I said, are you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? That could have been done four months ago. The very idea that this week they're saying, oh, why don't we get four white guys and, and General Kelly to come and do this? This is the Senate's bipartisan gang of six. You see them here. Republicans Graham, Flake, and Gardner, and Democrats Durbin, Bennett, and Menendez work to come up with a deal before next week's deadline. Senator Menendez defended the group. But is there an issue about getting that through a Republican House and a Republican Senate uh, with just this small rump group? Well, <laughs> I don't consider it a rump group. Okay. Uh, and we're in the midst of vetting it uh, with other uh, colleagues. Yeah, but the plan doesn't seem to be getting any traction with other colleagues. GOP Senators Cotton, Grassley, and Purdue issuing a statement saying there has been no deal reached yet on the future of DACA in the Senate. Some of our colleagues have floated a potential plan that, simply put, isn't serious. So a lot of work to be done, a lot of salty language. It's Friday, a week before the deadline when the government could be shut down, guys. It is Friday, that's for sure. Thank you very much, Griff. Have a good weekend. You so much for bipartisan panels. Yeah. All right. Around the clock negotiations over immigration and government funding. But are they being overshadowed by that big comment from the president? Texas Congressman Louis Gomer says immigration is a top concern for President Trump, and rightfully so. Our commander in chief is tired of the left refusing to cooperate. I'm not going to defend his language, but I will defend his frustration. I mean, here we've got people, and the only people they want to talk about being dreamers are people that came into the country illegally. And many of them, you know, we talk 
that people picture young, precious little people, and that most of them middle, or a lot of them are middle age. And then we're seeing statistics that the, a huge percentage don't speak English, even though they were getting free education and all kinds of free things. And you've got these same people that are pushing to keep MS 13ers here even more than they are to help make sure our dreamers who were born in America have that chance for the future. It is so frustrating. And every time, every time anybody in Washington talks about legalization of anyone here illegally, the Border Patrol says they get these surges and they've been getting them since August. And so it is a frustrating time. Now to a Fox News alert, brand new chilling dispatch audio just in moments after a murder suspect ambushed officers right outside their police department. We have an officer down, officer down. We got officer in the back of a vehicle. We are heading to the hospital. Authorities in Charlotte, North Carolina say Jonathan Bennett drove up to a group of at least six officers in the parking lot and started shooting. One officer hit in the leg before police returned fire, killing Bennett. He ambushed us. He shot at us. Times like this make you appreciate people who voluntarily put their lives on the line to keep us safe. Unfortunately, some people use that against us. Bennett was wanted for killing his girlfriend and kidnapping their two-month-old daughter. The little girl is okay. Right now, 120 million Americans are in the path of a deadly winter storm. The same one that sparked the devastating mudslides in California is now targeting the Midwest and the East, unleashing whiteout conditions and ice. Time is running out for nearly 50 people still missing at this hour in California. Evacuation zones expanding overnight, days after staggering amounts of rain triggered the devastating mudslides. 17 people dead, including four children, the youngest just three years old. All right now to it, Fox News alerts significant activity spotted at North Korea's nuclear testing site, sparking rumors that another test could be coming very soon. Think Tank 38 North releasing new satellite images showing mining carts and between 100 and 200 people working on underground tunnels. This after several hundred reportedly died in the passageways after nuclear testing uh, that happened late uh, last year at the end of the year. It all comes as Russian President Vladimir Putin praises uh, North Korea's dictator Kim Jong-un, calling him competent and mature. All right, in just a few hours, the White House will announce its decision regarding sanctions against Iran in the controversial nuclear agreement. While President Trump could continue sanctions relief that was put in place by the Iran nuclear deal, the president is expected to impose new and even tougher sanctions to crack down on Iran and their activities supporting terrorism. He has repeatedly slammed the Obama era program as the worst deal ever and has called on Congress to fix it or withdraw. More evidence that President Trump's tax reform plan belongs in the win column. At least 80 major companies announcing benefits and bonuses for employees thanks to the new tax law. And Todd Pyro joins us now with a look at the rapidly growing list and some good news this morning. Hey, Todd. Yeah, speaking of good news, this is it. Let's get right into the numbers. Take a look. These are just 20 of the 82 companies passing tax relief onto workers. So many, they can't all fit in one graphic. Check that out. Walmart just announced it will increase its starting wage to $11 per hour, and employees will get a bonus. Bonus of up to a thousand bucks. The Dow rose to another all-time high yesterday, jumping 205 points to close above 25,500. And a recent Quinnipiac poll shows that 66% of American voters say the nation's economy is excellent or good. That's the highest positive rating since the poll first gauged this topic back in 2001. All of this leading to the following tweet from one of the architects of the tax package, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy. He writes, "Quote." Armageddon isn't shaping up like the Dems predicted. Tax reform is already delivering wage increases, bonus for one million plus Americans, improved employee benefits, lower utility rates, end quote. Not to mention the expected bump in paychecks thanks to lower tax withholdings. Workers and their families will receive larger paychecks starting in February. 
This has uh, been a massive uh, project that we've been working on, beginning to implement the tax plan. There's a lot of work left to be done, but we're estimating that 90% of the workers are going to see an increase in take-home pay. But as you might expect, many Democrats aren't as enthusiastic. In terms of the bonus that corporate America received versus the crumbs that they are giving to workers to kind of put the schmooze on is so pathetic. It's so pathetic. Well, late yesterday, Fiat Chrysler said it will give employees a $2,000 bonus and add 2,500 new jobs as a result of the tax bill, relocating its heavy truck production from Mexico to Michigan. Robin Jillian. Thank you very much, Todd. All right, 10 minutes after the hour, it has gone global. Media bias so bad, people worldwide now say that they are tired of fake news. The nation ranked the worst, the United States. Former speechwriter for President George W. Bush, Ned Ryan, here with why he says the mainstream media is on the verge of destroying itself. Getting out of Gitmo, how suspected terrorists are now trying to use this tweet from the president to get out. And enjoy your hot wings at home, a brand new delivery service from Hooters. Stay tuned. Twenty fifth Amendment. They All would bring the, up the twenty fifth yes, amendment. Yes, actually, they they would say we're not in in the for sort of in the mid period. We're not at a twenty fifth amendment level yet. Um, or they would. It's alarming. All right, the mainstream media dedicating hours of coverage to this new Michael Wolff book uh, that absolutely trashes President Trump, uh, while they virtually ignore a very booming economy, a positive stock market, and some uh, pretty serious news regarding the reopening of the Clinton investigation. This, as a new Pew Research report, shows media bias in the U.S. is the worst in the world. The United States coming in dead last, with just 21 percent of Trump supporters saying the media is unbiased. Here to weigh in on this, former speechwriter for President George W. Bush and CEO of American Majority and GOP strategist Ned Ryan. Ned, thanks so much for coming Absolutely. in this morning to talk about one of our favorite topics, which is uh, the media has, uh, uh, despite amazing ratings uh, under the Trump administration, everybody's going gangbusters. Right. They hate this president, even though yeah. he's made them so rich. No, I, I, and this is the thing that I tell people, listen, we need the media. The media is a vital institution. Yeah. We want a free and honest press, but this Trump derangement syndrome has has gotten into the media so much that it's they can't see straight when they're dealing with Trump. And, you know, we see this poll, but I remind people, too, back in October, there was a poll at Politico that showed 46 percent of the American people think they make stuff up right not biased but actually make stuff up 46%. about six percent and then you look at Gallup Gallup does a poll about uh, Americans view of the uh, of the press or they've considered it trustworthy it was in the 70 percentile in the 1970s it's now 32 percent and I joke it's probably the lowest it's been since the invention of the printing press <laughs> But this shouldn't be a surprise. You look at how these people vote. A lot in the media, I think it was over 90% voted for Obama. A yeah. lot of these guys are Democrat operatives masquerading as journalists. And it's in some ways, 2017 has been extremely refreshing because the masquerade is over. We now see these people for who they are. And I think the thing that's also been interesting to me is they want to be seen as referees of a game, and yet they've inserted themselves into the game. Right, you can't be both. You can't be both. They want to be both. And the American people are saying you're either a referee or you're part of the game. And once you enter the game, you're no longer seen as objective. And the American people are really starting to peg them as, we know who you are, you're right. players in the game, you're not referees anymore. You mm. made reference to that political poll, and I want to go back to that. And it's uh, about the media fabricating stories, specifically about President Trump. 46% believe, yes, the media is fabricating stories about President Trump. If this continues going in this direction, if the media doesn't stop this, where do you see this going? Well, I mean, first of all, I think they have real issues on credibility. I mean, they are undermining the very institution in, in their attacks on Trump when people are saying, we don't believe you, we don't think you're objective anymore, we think you have a bias. And the thing that I've told people is the media wants to come off as these purveyors of truth and rightness 
just another guy with an opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's really gotten to the point where I view them as opinionists, not journalists, not reporters, just another guy with an opinion coming down from the, you know, coming into this arena and saying, we have our own specific worldview, we have our own specific narrative that we're going to drive. We just want a media that will actually say, hear the facts, right. you decide. But do people eventually stop listening? They do, and I think that's what yeah. the problem is. And the thing that's funny is to see the media's reaction. They're so biased, they're insulting as well. There's this certain elitism where we're telling you what to think. Mm -hmm. They insult people, and then they don't understand why people won't listen to them anymore. Let me ask you this. I mean, you know, when you go overseas and you watch the news, you watch the news in other countries, it comes off as very boring, it's very dry, it's all information. I actually love watching the BBC and some of these networks because you're getting raw information right. you form and the opinion you yourself. Right. In exactly. America, I, I, I want to ask you this because we've 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 created this to be more of a business than it is journalism anymore and it's so profit driven it's owned by major corporations opinion sells in this country opinion leads to bias that's right and that's the difference between american journalism and journalism i think throughout the rest of the world no and i think you, you'll see you'll see where certain channels uh... certain print uh... uh outlets are going a certain way because they think it's good for business sure. and they have found certain channels have found a certain niche in the market where they realize that people that are watching they want to hear a certain line a certain story it's it is profit driven in many ways it some is. of this and, and the, the the sad thing is though it is a polarization that's taking place in america and it's being driven in some ways by this whole profit model it's leading to increased polarization yeah. which is not a good trend for the american people for this country as a whole to get us to the point where we actually have a lot in common we all as american people we have a right. lot in common but this this trying to drive us apart in pursuit of profits and people only yeah. hearing what they want to hear anymore right. and that's, not hearing right. the other side that's the other thing yeah. too and it leads to a breakdown in dialogue Dialogue. And, and this is the thing that I hope with really quick on this whole immigration debate. There's actually a lot in common that people have on this whole immigration right. debate. Yeah. A lot of reasonable pe people on this side and on the other side. Let's get to the point where we can actually come to the yeah. right conclusions. See yeah. how long that takes. Thank you for joining us this morning. Great we appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is almost 20 minutes after the hour. Is WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange running out of places to hide? The message he just sent to the world. And Big Brother is watching. Facebook has invaded our smartphones. Now it wants to invade your home oh, with good. a camera and a microphone. That'd be interesting. Kurt the Cyber Guy here with how the social network is prying hey, into your Hi. private life. <laughs> hey, Kurt. <laughs> Eleven suspected terrorists are complaining about being stuck at Guantanamo Bay, and their plan to get out is to use one of President Trump's tweets to sue the Department of Defense and the Department of Justice. The detainees' lawyers say this tweet, saying in part there should be no further releases from Gitmo, claims that he plans to hold them forever, violating international law. The White House has not yet responded. All right, the House shooting down proposed limits on government surveillance powers while reauthorizing the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. That's FISA. At the center of this debate was Section 702, which allows the NSA to collect text messages and emails from foreigners without a warrant, even when they are talking with Americans. That's where it gets complicated. The failed amendment would have set limits for how authorities could use the information. Rand Paul is threatening to filibuster this bill which now heads to the Senate. Big Brother is listening. Rumors swirling that Facebook is set to unveil their own smart home device this year. And with it comes a wide angle camera, microphone and speakers all in your home. So does this raise privacy concerns? Here now is Kurt the Cyber Guy. Kurt, you got to look at the camera. Huge, try, trying to get a close up shot of you. I'm trying to get the latest news from Facebook because they, they're talking a lot all of a sudden. We called them yesterday about this story and it's rather remarkable. Uh, a device being put together, a Apparently about a 15 inch monitor that has cameras, microphones uh -huh. and artificial intelligence inside that they want in your home to be listening to Why? you and to be able to look at you. They're going to tell you that it has to do with, according to a website mm -hmm. called Cheddar, that, there, that this is a way to interface with the rest of your friends in a way to where you can walk up and it recognizes you and say, oh, hi, Jillian, who do you want to talk with right now? And boom, it goes and connects you. <sighs> um, the reality is you're probably going to be turning on the device in a way where you agree that Facebook can listen and watch at any given moment. There's so many things that can is, listen and watch now. Right, exactly. And the more and more comfortable
we get with it, the further they stretch that uh, that that idea into our privacy that we would have never allowed, say, five, ten years ago. Reality is, though, Facebook also talking about the the, the idea that they want to tweak how our timeline comes together and. After we called them about this story, saying, are you really developing something like this? They said, we have no comment on that. All right, give us some Suddenly, of your tips for this All now. right, here's Show what you want to do. Know. No matter what you're connecting with, this is a wake-up call again to say, how am I set up on Facebook? Right. What are my privacy settings? Because so I just want to show you this. Look they at this. change the settings yeah, sometimes. Do this tune-up today if you get a chance. So right here, you just go to your Facebook page, log on. Top right corner, you'll see right here, you click that, and you go to settings and then boom all this comes up and what comes up here is the idea of being able to see who is seeing your timeline right. how many people have access to it who by the way can post on your timeline and then who can see what you post who you're friends with who you're not friends with i don't even know and what can people see because recently facebook coming under fire again because accidentally they allowed advertisers mm -hmm. to have access to your own home phone number that was put there <laughs> and now you have an ability to go in and say what's there right now how has it tweaked because this is a fluid kind of setting for facebook you want to look at it every so often today's a great day to look at it thank you for and the say, reminder how am I exposed to the rest of the world? Do you like this idea? Uh, of this device mm -hmm. that they're coming out with? You know, uh, they have a building called Building 8. It's like Area 51 for Facebook. Uh, they have mind control technology that they have admitted to exploring oh in this God. building. Do I like it? I don't know yet. I okay. have to see it. There's always the convenience factor versus just this massive invasion mm -hmm. into our own lives. What my biggest complaint of Facebook is, is that it takes this away. Right. And there's a lot less we of like us. We like this. We like this in-person <laughs> stuff. And there's a lot more of this nonsense coming right. at us. Facebook seems to start uh, have a, they're starting to have a message where they're today announcing that they're going to change the timeline so that it's more about who my friends and right. family are and what they're saying rather than brands and who they think I should All be right. hearing from. Kurt, thank you for the tips. Thank you for the reminder. Go check your settings. Thanks for being here. Good to see you, Julie. Rob. All right, guys, thanks so much. 27 minutes after the hour, a break in the case of a college student found murdered in a park. His friend now a suspect, the brand new evidence and his outrageous alibi. Th their purpose is to chip away at our nation's promise of dignity and security for working families. It's really sad. Well, Democrats melting down as the Trump administration considers requiring people to hold down some kind of a job or at least do something in order to get free health care. Is this a good move or just more red tape? We're going to debate that coming up next. Friday morning and welcome back. The officers who planned the Niger mission that left four American soldiers dead could face punishment. Military officials telling CNN the officers may be reprimanded for not following correct procedure. The soldiers died in October when ISIS-affiliated militants attacked. The military is set to release its final report on the ambush at the end of the month. The mystery is growing behind the disappearance of an Ivy League student found dead. University of Pennsylvania student Blaze Bernstein's body was found at a park outside Los Angeles one week after meeting a friend there. We are now learning detectives spoke with the friend two days after the disappearance and noticed small scratches on his hands. The friend claimed the marks were from a fight club. Detectives say the friend appeared nervous during his interview. After more than five years of hiding out in its London embassy, Julian Assange now has Ecuadorian citizenship. The WikiLeaks founder announcing it by tweeting this picture of himself wearing the national soccer jersey. But he still cannot leave, the UK rejecting Ecuador's request to grant Assange diplomatic status, saying the only way to solve the problem is for him to face justice. A six-year-old boy who survived the Sutherland Springs Church massacre heading home in style. More than two months later, Ryland Ward, who was shot five times, is finally leaving the hospital. And the person that picked him up? The first responder that saved his life. I was the one that pulled him out of the church. Ryland's eyes just kept looking at me, never never took his eyes off of me, reached out for my hand. I knew from there it was going to be a special bond.
Gives you chills, huh? Little Rylan is the last survivor to leave the hospital after a gunman opened fire on a Texas church congregation, leaving 26 innocent people dead. Rob. All right, Jillian, thanks. Do you want free health insurance? Well, if you are able-bodied, then get a job, go to school, or volunteer. That is a message from President Trump to people who use or apply for Medicaid. The new guidelines opening the door for states to cut off benefits to those who don't have an approved reason. So is this a good idea? Here now to debate that is the executive director of Turning Point USA, Charlie Kirk, and executive director of Social Security Works, Alex Lawson. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on this morning. Uh, let's start, uh, Charlie, uh, you know, uh, this, this is an interesting idea. It's never really been tried to be, it's never been implemented in this program in, in 50 years, right? Right. I think it's a wonderful idea. Look, the best social program is a job. The goal of government programs should not try to get to people to stay there as long as possible. It should be trying to get people off of those government programs. And 40% of people that receive Medicaid are not working, able-bodied adults. Now, this does not count people with disabilities or children of the elderly. These are able-bodied adults. And look, they don't even have to find a job. They just have to go try and uh, pursue to uh, try to find a job. They don't actually have to be successful in trying to find one. The, the key point is this, is that we need to try to get people off of government benefits and back into the workforce. And with this booming economy, uh, this is a wonderful step forward. Okay. Uh, Alex, over to you. I mean, we, we've got a poll here that says it's 70% of people, uh, when they did a study, uh, support the idea of work requirements for Medicaid, that you got to do, show that you're doing something uh, if you are able-bodied. Now, this all started because states bear some burden in the cost of Medicaid, and they came to the president, I think, looking for support in this and getting people to work. You say this is a bad idea. Tell me why. Uh, look, this isn't a new idea. It's been around for a long time. It was tested in the 90s, and it's found to do nothing except create a bureaucratic nightmare of red tape. It doesn't save any money. Uh, all it does is put an onerous requirement on people who are trying to work. The best way to increase employment in this country is to create jobs, not by taking health care away from people, not by cutting off chemo for somebody who's undergoing chemo treatment for their cancer and that's exactly what this policy does medicaid is the largest provider of long-term care in this country and this is just a sneak attack on the entire system and alex you, you say that you say that most adults that are able to are working when they're on medicaid already but do you have a number to back that up i know you, you say it's the majority of adults but can you give me a number there I, I can. Uh, so even Heritage Foundation scholars looking at this see that it's a vanishingly small percentage of the 20 ish percent that this policy applies to after you exclude the primary recipients of Medicaid who are seniors, Kids, children yeah. and people with disability. OK, let me let me let, me let you, you chime in. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Well, so look, first of all, it's 40 percent of Medicaid recipients that are not working, that are able bodied and 40 percent of 70 million people is a very large number. And look, I will refute this. The goal of government programs should not be trying to keep people there as long as possible. We should try to get people off of government programs and back into the workforce. Medicaid was designed as a temporary health benefit for the working poor, not for people that want to turn a safety net into a hammock. We should try yeah. to get people off of government benefits and back into the workforce. And thanks to this booming economy, this offers an opportunity to do so. And Alex, that's a very classic you know, Republican line, is that we're out here trying to get people off social assistance, off of, you know, their dependence on government. And this sounds like a way that they're trying to do that. What do you say? What this is, is it's the establishment Republicans again making President Trump a liar from his promise not to cut Social Security, mm. Medicaid, and Medicare. This is an attack on the entire Medicaid system, including the fact that it's the largest provider of long-term care in this country. Nursing home care, $97,000 a year. That's what they're going after it here. So don't affect think it's elderly. Stops here. I mean, again, it doesn't affect elderly. This is for people that are able-bodied and under the age of 60 that can find yeah. a job, volunteer, or try to find a job. It does not affect elderly. Well, don't demagogue the issue. Come on. It's oh, a Trojan right. horse attack on the entire system. Okay. Well, you, you both have you both have different numbers, and I'd be curious to see what the real numbers are. And I'm sure it's a tough number to find: is how many able-bodied people are not working while sitting on Medicaid. 
or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Medicaid. Uh, and that, that is uh, at the heart of the issue, I'm sure. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming thank on you. this morning and thank you. debating your sides regardless. And thanks for dealing with the drilling as well. All right. Thank you. <laughs> The drilling that will never end. It's never end. It is 38 minutes after the hour. The NHL and the Army about to face off. The legal battle on the ice just beginning. No citizenship, no welfare. The new plan to weed out refugees in Europe. Should America consider this same idea? Brexit leader Nigel Farage weighs in on that coming up next. Cindy Crawford proving age is just a number, bringing back a Super Bowl classic. Wait until you see this. We're coming right back. Brazil is now following France's lead in combating fake news. The federal police announcing their latest plan, tweeting this photo, saying they are creating a specially formed group of government officials to combat fake news during the 2018 primary elections. This comes after French President Emmanuel Macron introduced new legislation last week downright outlawing fake news during election years. All right, the U.S. Army is taking on an NHL team over its name and colors. The Army filing a challenge to the Las Vegas Golden Knights, trademarking the name, saying it already has exclusive rights to that. The name Golden Knights has referred to the Army's parachute team for decades, along with the black and gold color scheme that they have. The Army claims that people could get confused. The team says it doesn't know of anyone coming to a game expecting to see anybody parachute. Uh, we'll see what happens with that one. Yeah. So this was government is putting their foot down to those living off state handouts. The country now banning citizenship to anyone who has lived on welfare in the country in the past three years unless they pay back the money they received. The move making it impossible for asylum seekers and migrants to become citizens. Here now to weigh in, former UK Independence Party leader and Fox News contributor Nigel Farage. Nigel, thanks so much for coming on with us today. We appreciate it. Is it interesting to you to see how the mindset uh, in the reality of all of these migrants coming into Europe, how, how the mindset has changed among some of these nations? Yeah, it really is. Um, I mean, don't forget the British referendum to a very large extent was about controlling borders. Um, and, and whilst, of course, civilized countries want to try and treat genuine refugees fairly, uh, what's been happening in Switzerland and elsewhere is that the welfareism system has been a magnet attracting people into those countries. Now, Switzerland is a very democratic country, the most democratic in Europe. It's the one place where the politicians fear the electorate because they can call a referendum on any of these issues. So we've seen this move in Switzerland, similar moves in Austria, and there are some really big fundamental changes taking place across European politics. So there are 45,804 refugees with asylum status in Switzerland. That was in 2016. Obviously, that number changes a bit year to year. But my question to you is, do you agree with this move and how do you see it playing out? Well, I do agree with the move because, you know, if somebody wants to get citizenship in a country, then I think to prove that they can speak the language, to prove that they've, in the course of the last three years, integrated and made some friends in the community, um, and to show that they're prepared uh, to pay their way. And if you like, if they've received welfare during that period, it's kind of like paying back taxes. And I think the Swiss are absolutely wholly justified in doing this, yes. Nigel, in this country, the far left, uh, who oftentimes are people that are almost embarrassed to call themselves American in a lot of cases, uh, you know, they have this view of Europe and of nations like Switzerland as the shining example of what America should hope to be someday if we ever can get there. Huh. And these are the people that have always called for open borders and call for socialistic policy. When they see Switzerland make a move like this, what does that say to them? Well, you're right. I mean, to Hillary Clinton um, and to those further left than her on the American political spectrum, they've always looked at Europe, and in particular the European Union, as you say, the shining city on the hill, uh, where everything is, 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 is totally civilized. Uh, look, there is, I promise you, that the British referendum of 2016 marked a pivot point in the way in which Europe is organized. And now what you're seeing in country after country are citizens 
demanding of their governments they put in place reasonable measures. And I, I genuinely believe that the days of open borders, the days of really unlimited welfareism, I genuinely believe those days are coming to an end. And what's happened in Switzerland overnight is simply a symptom of that. And Nigel, before we let you run, uh, President Trump canceled his uh, trip to London. What are your thoughts on that move? Very disappointed. Uh, we have, you know, an amazing business relationship between our two countries, a great military relationship, a great security relationship. Uh, we are, uh, you know, amongst the best friends of any two countries in the whole world. We have an American president who, unlike the previous one, actually likes this country, put the bust of Winston Churchill back in the Oval Office, <laughs> and he's been visiting France and Poland and Italy and Saudi Arabia and China and elsewhere, and he's still not been here. And I have to say, I find the whole thing really very disappointing. Um, he's made comments about the real estate deals that were done with regard to the old American embassy yeah. and the new one. Um, I can't comment on that. Uh, I guess he's better qualified to comment on real estate than anybody else. Um, but something else that might have been in his mind is that we have the left in this country, the Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, who's virtually a Marxist. We have the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, yeah. all saying that if Trump comes, there should be massive, large-scale demonstrations and protests. And I, I wonder whether that might just be a part of his calculation that maybe at this moment in time, he doesn't need those optics. Either way, I have to say, I'm very sad about it. Yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't feel welcome. I think that's, that's very clear on, on, on the decision there. Nigel, yeah. thank you so much for coming on this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Uh, 47 minutes after the hour, let's check in with Brian, see what's coming up. We got three more hours of this. Yes, three more hours of this. And could you act a little bit more enthusiastic when you say that, Rob, please? At least Jillian was when I saw her in the hall before. I am hey, very excited. Yes, because you have to come and watch the show and be on the show. Yep. Hey, let me tell you what's on deck over the next three hours, and hopefully Rob will approve. Uh, some great guests, including Ben Shapiro, number one podcast I think I can read uh, in the country right now. Governor Rick Scott here seems to win his battle with the White House on drilling. But we're going to be talking about the president getting a bipartisan deal on immigration, not happy with the initial overture, made some comments. Will he be able to overcome that today? Will he address that? We're also going to talk about major progress in the Fusion GPS investigation. It turns out the leader of that company was briefing AP reporters, according to our reporter. We're going to talk about what all of that means, all coming up on Fox & Friends. I urge you, I know it's Friday, but please get dressed. All right, welcome back to Fox Business Alert. Good news and bad news from Walmart, the world's largest retailer abruptly closing Sam's Clubs nationwide, laying off thousands of workers. The move coming just hours after the retail giant announced an increase to their hourly minimum wage. Tracy Krasko from our sister network, Fox Business, here with the details you need to know about. Tracy? Good morning. Yes, yeah, so the two announcements came almost within the same breath, but uh, Walmart is closing 63 of its Sam's Club locations across the country. Uh, so far, we've heard of them closing in Texas, New York, Virginia, and Arizona. We haven't heard of a full list yet, but this is potentially laying off thousands of employees. Many of them were not given any notice at all. Uh, so some of these locations will be turning into e-commerce distribution centers. Uh -huh. And people that are losing their jobs are encouraged, of course, to apply for some of these other jobs. But if you do have a Sam's Club membership, you can return it, get a refund if your location is shutting down. So Walmart gives the bonuses, mm -hmm. Sam's Club. Yeah. I think the Sam's Club is probably the, the Costco effect, I would assume, yeah. of a, a big competitor there. Okay, we're talking. I don't know why you wanted me to, to toss it this way. You're going to so get you. me in trouble. Hooters is going to deliver. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> yes. So, you know, of course, part of going to a Hooters restaurant <laughs> is the waitresses, the whole experience there. But some people may not be into that, a little embarrassed to go there, but they still want the food. So, yes, Hooters is getting into the delivery business. A delivery, food delivery, is actually one of the the largest growing sectors of the restaurant business. And so they're jumping in and they're going to be offering this now at its restaurants. And um, what's interesting is the CEO said, many people wouldn't step foot in our restaurants, but they want our product. So even he's kind of acknowledging really? that people- So the women in the tank tops aren't gonna be delivering your they food. They are not going to be delivering right, Rob's your never food. gonna order delivery. Well, that's then. what she said. She was like, who cares if the girls in the, aren't delivering the food? <laughs> and I also wonder how good could the food be at Hooters? I mean, that's not why anybody goes there. <laughs> All right, Tracy, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> All right. So the, the producer here is saying, uh, Desiree is saying that they have the best wings. Uh, we'll
we'll see about that. All right, 54. Well, I don't know why I'm telling you the time. It is 54 minutes after the hour, though. Do you uh, remember this? In case you wanted to know, I am flustered. Uh, remember this iconic Super Bowl Pepsi commercial from way back in 1992? <laughs> You want us to roll this again, Rob? <laughs> well, now Cindy Crawford is returning to her Pepsi commercial past. 26 years later, the 51 year old model will debut a recreation of the unforgettable ad at this year's Super Bowl on February 4th. It's called This Is the Pepsi, and it will feature her 18 year old son, Presley Walker Gerber. Randy Gerber, the luckiest man in the world. It is part of the company's Pepsi Generation campaign, honoring the brand's 120 year history, and Cindy Crawford does not age.